Before we start, I would like to point attention to a certain fact. This is what Wonder Woman, along with Superman and Batman, looked like back in 2009 when this movie came out. At the time of writing, this is what those three look like now. Between then and now, Wonder Woman has gone through this Odyssey look, these two looks from the New 52, and then the New 52's Justice League story arc Amazo Virus Forward. Wonder Woman has been sporting the same Michael Wilkinson designed costume made for Gal Gadot in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. Wonder Woman in the comics is still wearing that costume, while Superman and Batman have gone through the Batman Inc. suit, the New 52 suits, the DC Rebirth suits, and the Superman Reborn suit before they were forced back into wearing underwear on the outside again. Wonder Woman, on the other hand, has not been forced to go back into wearing this swimsuit design. So what does this observation say to you when acknowledging such concepts as male and female privileges? Okay, so I learned later after watching Wonder Woman 2009 that it is based on George Perez's Wonder Woman run from 1987. Specifically, its first arc, Gods and Monsters. So, the reason why this is not a comparison review is because I usually do those things the other way around. First, I go over the comic story and then watch the movie to compare the two. I will so take this as an another learning experience in discovering a proper and not too long format for movie reviews for movies that are original stories inspired by more than one story. Because we all know that the New 52 inspired the Camus had a lot of those. Now back to talking about this movie. It was the fourth animated film in the DC animated original movie universe, aka one of those movies that were being made just to get those movies made, and it was not exactly connected to the other movies made before or after it. That was both a good and a bad thing. Good, as in it was able to stand on its own feet without needing other DC characters as a crutch, and bad because... Well, the fact that it took me 14 years to sit down and watch it should speak for how well it was attracting an audience for itself. Slow sales of the movie on DVDs was also why they never made a sequel for it or for Green Lantern First Flight. Story-wise, I would compare this movie to a time capsule from a time long gone, with also some aspects that have either not aged well, have been changed for the better, and some things that are still the same. As this movie came out before the New 52, Wonder Woman as Diana is made out of clay by Hippolyta and Zeus is only seen as a presence in the sky giving it life, so making her not be one of Zeus's bastard children or a sibling of Ares who is the main villain of this movie. More about him later, but Wonder Woman's extended origin story then goes through the next somewhat necessary steps with the inclusion of Steve Trevor, who in this movie is such an unlikable person that in a different kind of movie I would also call him too dumb to live. In a nice way, I mean, because the mean way would be to call him a walking stereotype who thinks with his dick. In that sense, Chris Pine's version of Steve Trevor in the 2017 Wonder Woman movie was an improved version in more ways than one. The first example of this is how he is introduced flirting slash hitting on another pilot flying around with him that I'm sure by today's standards could come across as sexual harassment. Pucker factor? PF measures the severity of sphincter constriction in times of peril. Charming. Now, any further schooling you might need, I'm more than happy to take you under my wing. Don't fall for it, Rook. Zipper here's the kind of guy mothers warn their daughters about. Also, the fact that he is voiced by Nathan Fillion makes him come across as a Hall Jordan XP. Which, fun fact by the way, supposedly it was a plan sometime in the 1970s to pair up Wonder Woman and Hall Jordan's Green Lantern together, but then those plans got leaked and ended up getting abandoned. Supposedly. I'm not sure if that rumor is true. Anyway, Steve and his fellow pilots are shot down while Hippolyta is conveniently making Themyscira visible onto the outside world. So he ends up crashing into the Paradise Island where after getting out of his plane decides to, as I already said, 
Let his junk do the thinking for him. Turn around, dude. You do not want to get caught. Turn around. Turn around. And it is. An angel. Surrender. Uh. You cannot escape. Oh, I don't know about that, angel. Wow. I think I like you. Particular idiom. What does crap mean? No. Forget I even said it. <laughs> it's another word for excrement. You happy now, lady? See, my child? Happy? Not as I've always said. Here the true nature of man is laid bare. Having played Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I'm surprised he didn't say Malaka. God, your daughter's got a nice rack. Or she... And now let's talk about Ares next. In the movie's opening, we had a war sequence that eventually led the Amazons getting Themyscira and getting separated from the man's world. Ares being the god of war had naturally set that war sequence to start happening, and apparently that included him forcefully impregnating Hippolyta with a war child that Hippolyta put a late abortion on. At that point, the Greek gods decided that enough was enough with what Ares was doing just to feel powerful by taking away his god powers and placing him under imprisonment in Themyscira. Future Pika here. I'm adding this part into the video while I'm still in the middle of editing it. Similar to how the God of War series is inspired by the Greek mythology, Wonder Woman's lore also takes some broad strokes in retelling. For example, in the original Greek myth, Ares and Hippolyta, or Hippolyte as she is known there, were father and daughter, and the defiling that was done to Hippolyta was according to the myths done by Theseus, son of Poseidon, or Heracles as his ninth labor in getting her girdle back which Ares had given to her, although Hera may have sabotaged the circumstances that led to her death by telling the Amazons that Heracles was trying to steal their queen. Also, the Amazons in the Greek myth were called the daughters of Ares, and he was supposedly one of those papa bears that didn't like it when you hurt his children. And some of those wars that he inspired may have been as retributions to those things. It is fascinating how these modern retellings seem to want to paint him as the bad guy, while Zeus, whose bastard children were created by Rey, and his victim-blaming wife Hera are portrayed as the good guys. Okay, and now back to the review. Around the same time when Steve Trevor crash landed over there, Ares, as the only man on the island, had managed to seduce his prison guard, an Amazon named Persephone, and escape, which then served as an another catalyst for Diana to leave Themyscira and become Wonder Woman. The animated movie then includes the trial that Diana took place in anonymously when it was decided that someone has to go after Ares, and as the queen's daughter, Diana would have been barred from entering. Now that I actually think about it, I think the opening of Wonder Woman 1984 was trying to be the bare minimum recreation of it in seeing how the 2017 movie didn't have it. Following that spectacle, both Diana and Steve set off to Man's World on the invisible jet and... Modern Era First it was the World War II in uh, uh, the 40s, then it was the 60s or 70s, then it was the 80s, hmm, and go to the 90s. Now it's, it's the early 2000s, and then it 20, early 2010s. Steve, I've never seen children before, I'm... You know what? The DCEU and Snyderverse did it pretty well. In the face, in the fact of. What's wrong, little one? They won't let Wonder me One has been. A, in a, in the DC EU, Wonder One was on Earth, on a, on a, in the man's say. world, for a century, and was it's made okay. smarter than about the whole place, and not this kind of fish out of water. Wonder Woman 2017, that, that movie covered it out and then got past it. Would you like me to teach you how to sword fight? So, after no one witnesses their arrival, and Diana has taught a lone young girl how to commit unprovoked assault on boys, because hey, female on male violence is totally okay, right? They go meet Etta Candy before she became body positive and pulled up. Get out of here! 
On some poor woman when the new 52 happened. And there is an interesting point of view Diana brings up here on how she sees women taking an advantage on men. The advanced brainwashing that has been perpetuated upon the females of your culture, raised from birth to believe they're not strong enough to compete with the boys, and then as adults, taught to trade on their very femininity. How about we stay focused on that other social evil for now? Wait, so who exactly is she blaming here? Men, women, or both? Well, Steve does not make our camp look any better by trying to get Diana drunk, which doesn't work because she has a high resistance to alcohol, while they wait for a satellite tracking system to find Aries, which would definitely be recognized as an attempted sexual assault. What did I do? It's all true, isn't it, Steve? Everything my mother warned me about man's world is true. She even told me you tried to seduce me, and I, like a fool, told her. For now, let us only expect the best from the pilot. You tried to get me drunk. As if you could outdrink an Amazon, you pathetic lightweight. I know values dissonance is a thing, but was an attempted date rape seriously something that could be downplayed just because the plot suddenly needs to move forward next? I am not exactly qualified to talk about these matters, but even I recognize the difference between drawing attention to something that can happen in real life, and then treating it as if it's something that can be ignored after it has happened, or the attempt of it has been avoided and the perpetrator is allowed to go off the hook. As a matter of fact, after the following Wonder Woman vs Demos action sequence, which seems to take place in the same mall as that fight Superman and Wonder Woman had in the Paradise Lost episode of the Justice League cartoon, both Steve and Diana act like it didn't happen because they are too busy with the main plot. From that thing to another flower pot, did this part of the movie ever get turned into a step on me mummy meme? Because it looks like a prime real estate for such. After that, when Diana and Steve finally manage to track down where Aris is going, we get a fascinating subversion of expectations when they need to confront the cult of Aris, aka descendants of people who used to worship Aris in the ancient times, and who in seeing Aris walk around have their beliefs now justified. And, while a surprise surprise they are all men, when needing them to commit a human sacrifice, the scene is portrayed as if Persephone would be the sacrifice, but it was done so convincingly that when the bait and switch happened, I was just... Now, Persephone, I must call upon your aid once again. How is it I can serve you? Your dagger, please. <sighs> of course, my king. Okay. Prevent it. Prevent it. Diana, Steve, charge in and st and prevent what's happening here. Okay. Some subversions. I wasn't expecting this. And that human sacrifice is followed up with Ares going down to Hades to meet up with a fat version of Hades, who this way is the only Greek god who is visibly shown. And this was the best they got. This visit is done so that Hades could return Ares his godhood, since Zeus and Poseidon wouldn't do that. And while that is happening, Wonder Woman who got wounded fighting harpies is taken away from that ceremony site, and she then rightfully scolds Steve for trying to justify his actions while also thinking with his junk. Couldn't. What? Why not? I had to save you. Damn! Ow! Why I wouldn't you just say, me. I'm I one man, I worries. can't do it? Hey, if it weren't for me, you wouldn't be here right now. I'm an Amazon. Use the damn you logic! Say, you're, you're like one man, the they're, they're, they're better fighters than you, you had to do a tactical retreat! Oh, playing the sex card again, are you? You know what? I've had just about enough of listening to you go on about how terrible men are. Does the truth hurt, Steve? Newsflash! The Amazons ain't so perfect either. You act brave, but cutting yourselves off from the outside world was cowardly. Not to mention stupid. Like less communication between men and women is what the world needed. How dare you? No, I'm not done. You met your first man, what, like 15 minutes ago? And you think you have us all figured out? Well, I'm sorry. 
But not everything a man does is to further some misogynistic agenda. We don't hold doors open or pull out chairs for women because we're trying to keep you down. And I didn't save you because I thought you were some damsel in distress. I saved you because... because I care about you, Diana. And I'm not gonna abandon a friend in need. Man or... So woman. close. So close to having a actual... having, make, having a made a point. You should have saved the world instead of me. Maybe I figured the world's not worth saving if you're not in it. How about to say that you are not capable of doing something against much stronger opponents? And this case Ow, is not what I mean. You crazy Amazonian dragon lady. There's yeah. work to be done. This movie does not portray Steve By Trevor way, very well. You're starting to sound like it tries, and then it goes back. Portrayals like this is what makes me appreciate Chris Pine's version in Wonder Woman 2017. Because at least that guy knew how to read the room and knew where the line was. The movie's climax then has Aries use his influence to appeal to his followers' toxic masculinity. Because Persephone had to be his token female follower, and the opposing side has Amazons led by Hippolyta arrive to face them at Washington DC. And Ares also rises fallen Amazons as zombies on his side, while his influence also turns President Joe Biden into a more serious president who knows what to do. In this case, fire missiles at Temuskira when his advisor recognizes it as an unknown terrain and so a possible origin for Ares Ray. On one hand, that is actually true because that is where Ares fled away from, but luckily Steve manages to take the invisible jet and shoot those missiles down while Diana fades off against Ares. Also, while he followed the confronts Persephone and questions why she betrayed Themyscira for Ares, she justifies it as Themyscira's isolation from the man's world, having denied her as a woman from having a chance of finding love and creating a family. Have you not brought enough death and misery upon us? I'm sorry, my queen. I never meant to fall in love. Love? The Amazons are warriors. You turned your back on your sisters. No, it is you who did that when you turned your back on mankind. You were given a life of peace and beauty. And denied one of families and children. Yes, Hippolyta. The Amazons are warriors. But we... Are women too. This is something I'm sure some modern viewers who, like me, had not seen the movie yet would cringe at. But that is where the whole point of it being a chance, or in other words, a choice, means that there are different kinds of women who choose to be mothers and wives, while some other women choose to focus on their careers, to become lesbians, or to transition into becoming non-binary or even become men. It is still a choice that they have, and denying it is as bad as denying those other things too. Because denying the freedom of choice is like denying free will too, and that would have made Temuskira more of a dystopia than a paradise. Or, that is how I would see Persephone's motivations for joining Ares, and that was the best way I could explain it. That being said, I should also draw attention to this other Amazon voiced by Tara Strong named Alexa, who was portrayed in the opening sequence as a coward not fit for war, and was in the present day living more like a scholar than a warrior, and the other Amazons did not push her away from that chosen career into becoming a warrior. Outside of Persephone, who got wounded in the opening war sequence in saving her cowardly life, and then killed her later when she helped Ares escape from Tamaskira, so that was justified from her point of view. But in death, Alexa was also able to use her book smarts to release the undead Amazons from Ares' control. Regardless, when Joe Biden fired missiles at Temuskira, that gave Ares a power boost that then got nullified when Steve took it out. Ares is so shocked about having lost that power, that Diana decides to use the chance given to her to do to Ares what she did to Steppenwolf in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Zeus! Zeus! Wow. 
So Zack Snyder made Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman be as accurate as this animated version was. I wonder how both sects of his cult look at this scene. The movie then ends with Diana and the other Amazons having gone back to Themyscira. But because the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story, Diana starts to miss that misogynist who had objectified her and her sister since they found him. So he followed and decides to send her back to the man's world as a channel for communications between men and women. That means the final scene has Diana now living with Steve and operating as Wonder Woman, as this girl she taught how to assault men calls her. Well, that sure was an interesting movie to pay attention to. A mixed bag and a time capsule as I previously said, but the marketing for it along with the other early DC animated original movie universe films clearly wasn't good enough, and that is why it took a whole decade before another animated Wonder Woman movie was made completely disconnected from this one. That is why I would imagine Wonder Woman 1984 to exist, because enough people saw Wonder Woman 2017 and Patty Jenkins got Jeff Johns to be her yes man. Anyway, this 2009 movie seemed more story focused than character focused. But if I were to call it character focused, that focus was spread rather equally between the entire cast of Amazons like Alexa, Persephone, and Artemis, whom I did not speak much about, as well as with Ares when he sees his long dead son serving Hades. And with Steve Trevor being portrayed like a horn dog lusting after every Amazon he comes across, Diana herself came across as if she as the main character character was buried under her own lore and supporting cast. In retrospect, I fail to see her having any autonomy or independence when Alexa suggested Diana to disguise herself to enter the trial. And in the end, Hippoluta had to tell Diana to return to the man's world as Wonder Woman by also giving that nice guy another chance. I don't know, but maybe there is something I don't see here that other people do. Comment down if you have seen this movie and share anything constructive to add to what I just said. Finally, I suppose I should say something about the cast, or at the very least, those voice actors who stood out. Alfred Molina as Ares was a definitive show stealer. That a father would treat his own son in such a way fills me with sadness. Trax! My son? While Nathan Fillion being such a recognizable voice, that even with the material he was given, also managed to outact his more restrained co-stars. Tara Strong as Alexa was also noticeable, probably because she was Tara Strong. Art is precisely what we must do. And now, before yet another century passes, is the time to re-engage ourselves with the old world. But then I should also say something about Gary Russell as Diana and... The advanced brainwashing that has been perpetuated upon the females of your culture. Raised from birth to believe they're not strong enough to compete with the boys. And then as adults, taught to trade on their very femininity. How about we stay focused on that other social evil for now? How do you expect to defeat Zeus if you can't even beat a girl? You're being optimistic if you think I've reached the height of my powers. You see, since I've been gone, man has created a weapon of such awesome destructive force that their use of only one of these weapons feeds me with the psychic energy of a thousand wars! Oh, crap. Oh, thank you, Stevie. You're such a gentleman. <laughs> I'm not sure if she was good or bad. I suppose serviceable is the most polite way of calling it, because trying to compare her to those three previous examples then makes it seem unremarkable. But what do you think? Like I said previously, comment down below if you have seen this movie and saw something I clearly didn't. I suppose my next video project will be a comparison review on the Throne of Atlantis in seeing how Jason Momoa's final Aquaman movie is coming out now at the end of the year. Until then, remember to like this video, comment your thoughts below, share this video for more people to see, 
and subscribe to my channel for upcoming videos. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.